It's time to bring out the better world Ian in all of us. Welcome to Better World Ian's Radio with your hosts, Ray, Mary Sue, and Gregory Hansel. Better World Ian's Radio inspires you with the people and ideas that are making the world a better place. You'll hear how small acts can make a big difference every day. Now, here are Ray, Mary Sue, and Gregory. Hi, welcome to Better World Ian's Radio. Better World Ends Radio is a weekly broadcast whose mission is to uplift and inspire you to make the world a better place. I'm Ray Hansel, joined today by my co-host, Mary Sue Hansel. Better World Ends Radio is brought to you by Better World Ends Foundation and is co-hosted by the family team that created the popular social game on Facebook called A Better World. It rewards players for doing good deeds while helping to raise money and awareness for charities. To date, over 40 million good deeds have been done in a better world by more than 4 million people in over 100 countries around the world. Today on Better World Ian's radio, we're talking about the Dollywood Foundation, Dolly Parton's nonprofit she founded to support children and families around the world. Joining us today, David Dotson, the president of the Dollywood Foundation. He oversees Dolly's Imagination Library, which we'll discuss in depth during this episode. He also supports Dolly Parton's productions, including editorial assistance on Dolly's many books. David pre- previously served as executive director of Associate Catholic Charities of East Tennessee. He's also a member of the board of directors of the Public School Forum for East Tennessee. Hi, David. Welcome to Better World Against Radio. Well, hi, Ray. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on board. This is a, a special program for us. Our Better World Ends uh, listeners out there are going to be anxious to hear what you have to say. Now, Dolly Parton is known as someone with a really big heart. So what makes her a Better World in, in your mind? Well, then one of the, I guess, the nicest things about Dolly, uh, is first and foremost, is certainly get asked this a lot, is the person you see in public is exactly the person who she is in private. There is no difference. What who you see is exactly who she who she is. It, in terms of you know the big heart and kind of think why people are so drawn to her. I guess five quick things always jump out to me. You know, one is her eternal optimism. Uh, you know, her eyes and her heart are always first drawn uh, to the good in people and to the good in a situation and to the good of an opportunity. And I think that's uh, that's infectious uh, in terms of her of her optimism. Obviously, her second or generosity has always been, um, you know, legendary. And I say that not only in the philanthropic sense of the foundation and her programs, but just the generosity of her spirit. She's a she's a giver. You know, she likes uh, she's incredibly generous to her family and her friends, and uh, not just in a monetary kind of way, but in really giving herself to to do whatever they need. Um, she's extremely grateful. Um, she knows while she certainly knows she has talent and knows that she's worked extremely hard. She's the first to always recognize that there's also a bit of fate and blessings, uh, a great deal of blessings involved in all of this. And she's grateful for the position that that she's been in. And, and then lastly, I think are two things that kind of go hand in hand. Uh, the thoughtfulness. She's a very thoughtful person, um, very instinctive person, but also, you know, a, pers- a, f- a person who really thinks before she speaks and uh, and is really a uh, I don't know, just sort of has a quiet soul about her, which probably wouldn't people wouldn't know. And that's tied into her spirituality. I think that I know she's very, very spiritual. And I think anybody whose life is grounded in their spirituality also uh, knows full well that there are things uh, larger than themselves. Well, that's a really <clears throat> that's a really good explanation. Um, so tell us a little bit about Dolly uh, and her childhood. What was that like? How, how, how has that helped to inspire the philanthropy that's become such a big part of her career? Well, she grew up extremely poor in the objective sense of the word. I, again, I, I know people who know her, she's quick to say that she never really felt poor uh, because of the love that they shared in the family. And they, you know, always thought they wish they could have had more, but you know, from just an objective standpoint, it was a lot of people living in a very small house in a rural mountain valley in Tennessee. So, um, you know, by any kind of material standards, 
uh, and certainly in terms of security standards, financial security, it was uh, just hoping that tomorrow brought the same blessings of today. And I think, you know, for her, it's it certainly shaped her her you know career and her philanthropy in a big way, which is um, in terms of knowing, first of all, in her career that she wanted to be successful. She knew there was a, a world out there beyond you know where she was living, and she wanted to experience that world. But hand in glove with that, she once that she achieved what she dreamed of, she knew it was her obligation to to give back to her hometown and to give back so that uh, she could be of you know help and support to other people so perhaps they wouldn't experience some of the hardships she had to face. Now she founded the Imagination Library over 20 years ago and that <clears throat> distributing free books to kids around the uh, around the country. So what what inspired her to do that? Her father, her father um is you know she in her words is the smartest man she ever knew but he couldn't read or write and you know he made a living for them with his hands and his back but uh she always felt like gosh if he could have known how to read or write there's no telling what he could have done for himself and for his family because he was so smart but she saw very early on the limitations that that created for him and for their entire family so Again, when she was in a position to do something, she wanted to do something that honored him. And as you know, we scanned the, the sort of landscape of possibilities. This notion of what are, what would be a real inspiring and creative way to help children learn uh, to love books, to love reading, to be inspired by it. You know, that was really the place from which the program was created. Yeah, that's very interesting. We. We actually have a charity of the month program I'll describe in a few minutes to our audience, but effectively one of the people that we, we covered was a company called First Book, which is is mm-hmm. in the same space. So we uh, Yeah, oh, I know them quite well and Kyle the president, they're good yeah. colleagues and friends. So they do they do <coughs> create had, wonderful had, work. So how does the yeah, imagination yeah, really. library actually work? What do you what do you, what do, what does that do? Uh, the b- very brief history is it was was created simply and exclusively for the children here in our hometown. Um, Dolly's view of philanthropy has always been take care of your hometown and your family. And so all kinds of things over the years came from that place. Uh, certainly the foundation and its work before the Imagination Library with scholarships and supporting the schools and, you know, with a program designed to to reduce the dropout rate in the high schools back in the early 90s. And then then economically, you know, the creation of Dollywood and the other businesses, family entertainment businesses that have been created here, you know, are all about how to how to give back and take care of the town. The library was back to that point of after some work for years in the school system of saying we needed to do something significant with the children before they attended school. And if there was one thing that we could do, you know, what would it be? And that would be this love of reading and books. And if there was one way to inspire that, it was how about the uh, lots of books, the gifting of lots of books to a child. Uh, and that lots uh, translated into once a month from birth until their fifth birthday, mm. uh, brand new books, carefully chosen, but most importantly, uh, with the child's name on the label oh. of the book and mailed right to the child at home. So, you know, the fact that the child was getting not a charity or a social service or even an educational literary program from the child and the family's point of view, they were being given a gift. Mm-hmm. And we felt like, and she certainly felt like, those kind of terms and those kinds of situation would elevate this to something very different than, than a program. Um, we felt like it was, you know, a terrific success. Um, but then back in the 2000s, other people in other communities were saying, we'd like to do this too. And we knew that we couldn't fund it and she couldn't fund it everywhere in the world. So we worked out a business model where if local communities adopted the program paid just for the books and the mailing for their children, then she absorbed all the overhead. We had a replicable and affordable model for this program to grow and since 2001 to today so you know you're looking at a 
16 year period, we've gone from gifting through to, to about 2,000 children a month hmm. to now 1.1 million per oh, month uh, across the world. <laughs> so, uh, needless to say, uh, the program caught on with the people. Mm-hmm. So we're quite <coughs> it certainly happy did. About that. What, <coughs> what a wonderful story to see how that that spreads so so uh, so widely, and I'm sure it's still it's still spreading. It is. As a matter of fact, these last couple of years have been still some of the fastest growing years we've ever had. We keep setting records uh, each year with number of children involved. Uh, this past November is when we crossed the million children a month threshold, and that had long been a dream of hers and of mine as well to think, you know, gosh, could we get to one million? And, and then coming uh, early next year, we'll hit that second sort of uh, threshold uh, and, and standard we never thought we could achieve, which is we will have gifted uh, over 100 million books since it started. Uh, and, I, and it is important to say, you know, she's the first, like she's not doing all this by herself. This network of local sponsors and organizations in several countries, you know, from United Ways to Rotary Clubs to governments to education foundations, community foundations. It's a vast network of partnership, and that's why it's been able uh, to grow the way it has. That's fantastic. Now, can anyone actually sign up to receive the free books? They have to live in a community that's sponsoring the program. Um, our goal would be, uh, you know, clearly one day be everywhere no matter what, but right now we are in those couple of thousand communities that – sponsor the program. We do have, um, like in Tennessee, obviously our home state, in Tennessee it is universal um, that any child who is in Tennessee under five can sign up no matter where they live. We're trying to replicate that in Alaska, Arkansas, South Carolina, some of the major cities, so that within these large places there's the universality of access. But right now, you know, the fact of anyone in America being able to sign up anywhere is still a dream and a big one. But one thing we've learned about ourselves is we're mighty big dreamers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Got to dream big. Got to dream big. Now, what does the Absolutely. future look like? What, does, what do you think the future looks like, speaking about dreaming big? What, what, do you, what do you see as the future for Imagination Library? Well, and we're, we have a 10-year plan, and um, we're about the third year of it that we, uh, Dolly, approved and we'd like to see um, where we're currently operating, which is the U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, and uh, Belize. And I'll mention Belize here in a minute. That we'd like to have 10% of all of the children under five in those countries actively participating in the Imagination Library. And then the other uh, 90%, you know, knowing about the program. At 10% of those populations, we're looking at 2.3, 2.5 million kids a month. And we figure at that kind of scale, I mean, obviously we're doing this not not just in, for everybody to feel good about giving and receiving, but about really moving the needle for children as they move through school that, at you know, scale is everything. And if we could impact that many children in a positive way so that they're entering kindergarten, not only with a love of books and a love of learning and a love of reading, then that's going to translate into, you know, academic success, where no matter how it's measured, test scores, grades, you know, whatever, that uh, I think we all know with all of us who've had kids that kids really, they lo- they'll do what they love to do, and it's really hard to make them do something that they don't like or love to do. So, you know, how to so I think there's you can tell about the future would be at this kind of scale over five, ten years, we'd see everything that kind of falls out from that over over a child's academic career, which is better grades, uh better motivation and hopefully better people. Better people, better worldians, okay. That's well, right, there you go. We we've come full circle. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk more with David Dotson about a Dollywood Foundation in a moment, but right now I'd like to take a brief break. And tell our listeners a bit about our game on Facebook called A Better World. A Better World encourages habits of love and goodness, positive mindsets, and giving to social causes to make a positive difference in the world. Players actually do things like send hearts, love, express gratitude, share acts of kindness, send get-well notes to real-world sick children around the world, and, and so many more things. 
Each month, we partner with a different charity and challenge our players to do a certain number of good deeds within the game itself. When they do, we release funds to our charity partner of the month. Charity partners have included Cure International, where we've actually helped to perform surgeries for removal of cleft palate and, and knock knees in different countries around the world. First book, providing books to children for, for the first time. World Vision. Uh, and uh, and many more, including Mary's Meals recently, where we, they actually are now up to doing a million bowls of porridge every single day for uh, for children in disadvantaged countries, and at the same time getting that porridge at, uh, at, at a school level where they can also educate their minds and feed their bodies. This month we're partnering with Experience Camps. Experience Camps are one-week summer camps for children whose parents, sibling, or loved one has died. When our players reach the goal that we set for the month, we will release funds to send kids to camp. You can find out more at abetterworld.com. So let's not get back to our conversation with David Dodson, president of the Dollywood Foundation, and my co-host, Mary Sue Hansel. Hi, David. Hi, Mary Sue. I really enjoyed listening to all those wonderful characteristics of Dolly. I would add just one more, if I can be so bold to say. Oh, I th- please do. I think she just exudes love. You know, whenever mm-hmm. you hear her speak or even see her in a movie, there's just a lot of love that comes from her. But uh, there is indeed. She's uh, a uh, she is a tremendously uh, loving person, and um, you know everybody responds to that love for sure. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, she made headlines last year with the My People Fund, which raised millions of dollars. How much for families affected by the wildfires in Tennessee? Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, it was because it was definitely a bit of a, a departure from business as usual. But then, you know, when fire happens, it mm. certainly disrupts people's lives from business as usual. So, on Monday, May, on Monday, November the twenty eighth, uh, we'd had a terribly dry uh, summer, one of the driest, uh, in, you know, in falls that I've ever seen, and been warm. And you know, it, it rains a lot in Tennessee, and it hadn't rained in months, which is highly unusual. And that evening, uh, we've had fires around the place. It was extremely smoky. There was a big fire up in the National Park, and, uh, you know, you couldn't hardly see very far in front of you, but still it was, you know, an alarm, kind of, you know, be on alert. But, you know, these things tend to be contained. And essentially what happened was the perfect storm of everything coming together that Monday evening of extremely high winds, 70, 80 miles an hour, uh, downing power lines, which sparked fires all over the place. And then the main fire swept down the mountain and into the outskirts of Gatlinburg. And then suddenly, you know, by nine or 10 o'clock that night, as we were watching the news and my house included, you know, packed and ready to evacuate, it was clear that an untold number of people were literally running for you know for their lives from their homes. Yeah. So on the next day, it was kind of like a, a zombie day, really, of trying to understand what had happened and emergency shelters and those kinds of things. So, um, kind of, I went around to look at what was happening, and then on Wednesday, Dolly was on tour. She, uh, we sat over at Dollywood's offices, the head of Dollywood, myself, Ted Miller at Dolly Parton Productions, and. Pete Owens from the uh, public relations part, and Dolly was saying, well, this is what I think we should do. I want to put money in the hands of people uh, and as quickly as possible, but I want to focus solely on the people who lost their primary residence, who had no home to return to. We didn't know how many. No one knew how many. Nobody knew you know, what we were facing, and that evening was the premiere of her second Coat of Many Colors movie, oh. and so mm-hmm. she said uh, – Hey, NBC said I could uh, maybe do a, a, a video message at 9 o'clock at the top of the show, but can we be ready? So, of course, we said, sure, we could be ready. And then was like, how the heck are we going to be ready? Uh, but from like noon, uh, from well, one, 11 to 1 o'clock that day, we created the name, you know, the My People Fund. Uh, kind of got down, we knew what we wanted to do. From 1 to about 6, uh, Jacob Timmons and his staff, uh, who we work with, we all be pulled together, the, the website, the donor uh, part behind it, the donation part. Uh, she filmed a video. It turned out NBC didn't air the video at 9, so we flipped it to uh, the social media. And the next morning, we woke up to a million dollars. So wow. we then had uh, a couple of weeks 
to kind of do the distribution that we wanted to do because the idea was that everyone who lost their home to the fire would get $1,000 a month for six months, which we felt was cash in their pocket over a, a nice period of time that would help them. There's many other aspects to recovery than what we were doing, but this would sort of be an unconditional loving response to uh, the situation. So in two weeks' time, we went from that to handing people their their first checks, and uh, we, you know, the numbers became were far greater than we originally had thought. But uh, we're at about the ten million dollar mark now, and that's enough uh, well, that's money fantastic. to fulfill Dolly's commitment. So uh, we were fortunate enough, and with all the kindness and generosity from literally around the world, uh, that we were able to be in the position to to do exactly what we intended to do. Well, David, that that's just wonderful. Uh, I know I was checking out your Facebook page and saw all these really heartfelt stories that uh, people put on the videos of how thankful they were. Is there one that comes to mind that you might share uh, with our audience? Yeah, there is. It's 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 a uh, it's a great story and um, it's it's a funny one as well. But oh, okay. uh, it does. There's you know there's one that always jumps out and there was a man who. Uh, he and his wife had retired here, mm-hmm. and uh, he was working part time in one of the stores. And that uh, they lived in an area that there was about a row on top of a ridge of about ten cabin houses. Uh, they lived there full time, and others, you know, rented the cabins out. So, anyways, he said that when the fires started, you know, uh, which is the same story we've heard, it just happened all so quickly. And without real warning, and suddenly, you know, it was an inferno around your house. And they told his wife, we've got to get the, just get the cat and let's get out of here. But he said right before he got in the car, he called his best friend in Toronto and said, I just want you to know, I think the fire is going to get us. Uh, I don't know if we're going to make it, but I sure hope I can call you in the morning. So he they, he had a harrowing story about getting off the top of the ridge and road being blocked but they made it right so the next day uh uh, he went back to go look at it and this was again a story you hear a lot about where it would be like burned house burned house burned house and then right there next to their house was a, a big cabin that was completely untouched by flames in any way shape form or fashion and then burned house burned house wow so uh so the people who owned the cabin next to them uh, they rented that out, and, and they called him up, and he said, your house made it, you know, and they were like, great. So they came down, and they had dinner, you know, a few days later. It came down from, I think they were in Cincinnati, and they the, the folks who owned the home that didn't burn took him to dinner and said to this fellow and his wife, you know, we've talked it over, and we've decided that we're going to give you this house so you can live in it. Oh, and, wonderful. Um, and he was like, oh, you, you can't do that. I, I tell you what, just let us live there till we rebuild. So uh, they, they, you know, a couple more weeks go by. It's Christmas time. They go up to uh, uh, the, this family invited him to Cincinnati to spend a few days and go to a Christmas party. And lo and behold, he had already talked to his friend in Toronto, that who he called that night. The, call, the friend called him that night and said, you know, I didn't tell you all of the story. And he goes, well, what's that? He said, well, when you called me and told me that you, you may not make it, he goes, I'm not a very religious person at all and never really thought this, but I thought I've got to pray for them. So he said, All night I just kept praying for, you know, one one eight mountain way, one one eight mountain way. Please God, put the hand of God one one uh, eight mountain way and the fellow said he's heard that he goes, Well that's really great, but that's not our address. <laughs> so, so they started laughing, he goes, Oh no, it's not your address and it was the address of the house next to them that didn't burn. Oh, I got and, all goosebumps on hearing that one. I know, I know, so did I when he was telling me, and so he said they just couldn't believe it, and, you know, so it all turned out, uh, that was just an amazing story on all levels, you know, the generosity of the people who offered their home to them, uh, you know, the fact that they made it, and then this very funny uh, and quirky story about, I guess it goes to show that even if you've got the wrong address, you should (laughs) still keep praying. (laughs) I love that, David, thank you. Now, how can our listeners help support the My People Fund? Well, you know, interestingly and and thankfully enough, we have enough money to do what we need to do. So we're not really seeking donations anymore, but there are still 
other needs in the community, you know, beyond what we're doing. And mm-hmm. if people go to mountaintough.org, um, okay. it, is the, it is the place that's locally operated of all the local efforts in Sevier County that are still tending to the short and long-term recovery. So all of those mentioned in that website, um, you know, are wonderful organizations that we fully and completely endorse. So is Mountain Tough? How do you spell tough just so they get it correct? Yeah, uh, T-O-U-G-H. So okay, mountaintough.org. Mountain dot, dot well, thank you very much. Now, I understand yeah. there's quite a bit of philanthropy that Dolly does anonymously. Uh, can you give us any tidbits into that? Well, um, you know, I, I can't reveal any secrets. No, no. Course, but the, uh, but, we, we won't but tell. She, um, <laughs> yeah, she, yeah no, that's right. None of the people out there listening will, will tell. Uh, she, she's, it, you know, you, you had it so right in the beginning about being a loving person. And, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, with that comes a, a real deep and abiding sense of caring for people. So, you know, when she when she sees things on TV and in the media, you know, really, no matter what it may be, whether it's, you know, disasters or individual stories of kind of pain and courage or something that really moves her, um, you know, she she responds in, in a way that, uh, you know, that she wants to. I mean, you know, we, she likes to obviously formalize her, her work through the foundation because it has such scale and uh, such sure. hopefully positive impact. But she also has always wanted to retain and act upon her own very individual and personal decisions to to help whomever, whenever, no questions asked, no plan, no strategy, you know, no yes. none of the things that kind of come with, with putting something more formal into play, but just retain that, that ability to to respond on a personal level when she's moved by something and, and she does that. That that's she's a great person. Now how do you believe Dolly Parton and the Dolly Parton Foundation is helping to make the world a better place? Well, that's, you know, that's a great question. You you can only hope you are. Um, you, I guess you're never really sure if you have, uh, maybe after you're gone, somebody could tell you. But, um, you know, for us, I think, and we'll start first with her and, uh, you know, clearly what she wants to do to make the world a better place is, um, you know, like I said, started in a more specific way of how can I make my hometown a better place. Mm-hmm. Uh, she she talks to her about her Smoky Mountain DNA that, you know, this where she was born and the town that she was raised in. And even though she had a lot of pain and a lot of poverty, she has a such a love for her hometown and such a feeling of obligation and commitment to make it and, it, and its people. That's why she came up with the my people. These are my people. and mm. And really, what can I do for them? So I think... For her, if she were to be able to look back um, from up above and see, you know, over her lifespan that what she's left here, you know, she's left um, obviously a, an economic engine that has given all kinds of people work and prosperity to the county. Our county is very different than the surrounding mountain counties because of this. You know, she's given children, um, you know, the love of reading and then you know, uh, a, a huge amount uh, in terms of dollars of scholarships for kids to pursue their dream in college. Um, you know, she's uh, left a, a new hospital with a birthing unit named after her that she's wow. given to to help bring children into this world. I mean, she's definitely will have left Sevier County, you know, a, a, a much better place than it was when she was born. And, and, and I think anybody who lives here would would you know echo that to say that this is a very different place to live because of Dolly Parton, and not to mention all the wonderful, uh, you know, things that she's done, the enjoyment that she's given people with her songs and with her movies. It is exactly right. Um, you know, the uh, having we kind of are uh, an all uh, one stop shop here. Oftentimes, of people contacting us to express you know, whatever thoughts they have about her and, and whatever uh, she's involved in. But when you read emails and letters and receive phone calls, and, and I think we all know this in our personal life, how, how much a song 
can mean to one at a certain time in your life or just right, right. the way the song's written can mm-hmm. capture an emotion that maybe mm-hmm. you can't articulate yourself, but a song and the words of that song capture it perfectly. So many people talk to us and share with us stories of their life and of, you know, times of, of you know, honestly of despair or uh, times of real uh, of love and at the height of, you know, with marriage and you found your person and just what her songs have meant to people. They've always been there to comfort people, to inspire people, to share love with people. And, uh, you know, that's a legacy that will last till the end of time, I'm sure. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that that's an incredible Better World End story. She really exemplifies exactly what we think we mean when we say this is truly a better world. And so for our listeners, you can learn about the Dollywood Foundation by going to the dollywoodfoundation.org. David, thank you so much for joining today on joining us today on Better World Ends Radio. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for all the fa- fabulous work that you're doing as well. It's a real pleasure to, to be on your show. Well, you're very, very welcome. Better World Ends Radio is brought to you by Better World Ends Foundation, a 501c3 whose nonprofit mission is to make the world a better place by encouraging the very best in everyone. Essentially, we believe that it's, uh, it's more important to plant flowers than just pull weeds. So we focus on positive thinking, positive values, and positive actions. In short, our vision is to bring out the better world in everybody so that we can all make it a better world. But we sure could use your help. Donations support our Better World Ends radio podcast, as well as go towards developing new features like articles, videos, blogs, and many, many more. We need your help from people like you, Better World Ends, to ensure the success of the mission. So go to betterworldians.com to become part of this important mission. And until next time, everybody, please, be a better world leader.